Hi, everybody. This is Mary Ellen Slater, and I am the CEO and founder of RepCap. We're a content marketing agency that specializes in HR tech, insurance, and financial services. We work with lots of consultants, um, and I am super excited to talk to you this morning. So let's let's jump on in here and get started. So the first thing I want to talk about is actually what we're going to talk about. Um, we're first going to kind of think about why is content marketing so important for management consultants, like for all consultants, for management consultants in particular. Then we're going to walk through some of the key elements of a content marketing strategy that's for consultants and then talk about the types of content strategy for consultants because I actually put them in buckets. I do think that there's they usually kind of overlap, um, but there's different ways that we uh, that we tend to think about this problem. So first, why does this matter? Why does this matter so much? You know, the thing about content marketing, you know, I think it's been around a while. You know, I think originally in many ways, consultants were the original content marketers. I think they've always known that thought leadership content was an important part of how we would communicate our ideas and get things started, right? So as we think about how like to build, we need to build trust, I guess, is the way I would really think about this. You're building trust and this allows you to build that trust at scale. The other thing that it does, and that's where it drives the marketing side, the other sort of knock-on benefit I think sometimes people forget about for consultants is it also forces you to crystallize your thinking in ways. The actual work of creating the content has benefits inside the firm as well as outside the firm. So this is an absolutely critical path, I think, for any consultant who wants to scale now. Um, the other piece I want you to think about is something with your audience. Um, buyers... People don't buy anything anymore without extensive research. And while this trust radius report here that I'm, I'm referencing, you know, kind of makes clear, I think what probably something all of us know in our, in our personal lives and the way we shop is that we want to look things up before we talk to people. We definitely don't want to start by talking to a salesperson. You know, we, we want to be able to find out uh, things about people. And while this trust radius report was about tech specifically, I can't imagine any reason why you would think that people wouldn't want to have a similar way to poke around and find out and get to know a consultant they were thinking about hiring. This is how they can see if they want to hire you or not. But the number's at 100% now. Nobody, the conclusion here, no one wants to talk to sales first. Like, that's the conclusion to take here. All right. So in the context of how you, you know, what kinds of content you should make and so how you should approach this as a consultant. I, I think of this as it's what I call the CVP, right? Like what are those critical elements? If you got two elements to have a great content strategy, one is going to be finding what I call your CVP and then the other one is going to be developing a meaningful way of promoting your content. So what do I mean by CVP? Your CVP, actually, I'm gonna close this here for a second. Your CVP is what makes your content special. Because the number one problem that people have when it comes to content marketing, consultants and everybody, um, is that their content isn't differentiated. You know, I, as I like to quote Tyra Banks, you know, I'm sure other people, the very versions of this over the year, but I like to hear Tyra saying it in my head, um, different is better than better, right? And CVP is how you are different, right? It's how you're different. So, and here's what I mean by that. You know, like I said, I mentioned I work a lot in HR, you know, even before I started the agency, before that I was a journalist who worked and covered HR and workforce issues, which means I've literally been reading and writing about the future of work for 20 years. Um, and what happens here is like people will come and say, I wanna be a thought leader. I wanna write about the future of work. We wanna be experts in the future of work. I'm like, okay, what about it? Right, because we've been talking about this a long time and a term like this, you're never gonna own this. Nobody's ever gonna associate this with your business. So, you know, we have to think about this in a, you know, a little more specific way. If you wanna own a term like this, I mean, you can do it, but as you can see, like you're gonna need to bring a McKinsey type budget here. Um, so before some of you start patting yourself on the back about how we don't say things like, you know, future of work. It's like, Bet you're talking about the great resignation because some of you are about to stop talking about that for two years. And I just want to tell you right now, there is literally only one person on the planet who gets to claim that term as thought leadership. His name is Dr. Anthony Klotz. And he said that term offhand in an interview with a Bloomberg reporter and pretty much then launched a movement, you know, of people that ended in a Beyonce song. I mean, maybe it's ended. I don't know. I feel like after that, we went to quiet quitting once it got to Beyonce. It was over. 
And what makes me really sad about this, you know, I guess this is just what you have to do to get tenure. I don't know. We can ask Dr. Dr. Klotz, but um, he actually, we just did a webinar with him earlier this week with our friends at Better Works, and he's, he has new and interesting things to say, um, and is just as perplexed as anybody else that, like, of all the things he's ever said in his very storied academic career, that's the thing that took off. So, it's a cool guy. You should go read his thought leadership. All right, so here is what winds up happening, just as I was just showing you, like, your people are putting out all this content and it's utterly undifferentiated. So you could line up, you know, people will put tons of work into developing, you know, the venture, like sort of the value proposition for the business and for the product. And then they'll make this content that looks and sounds exactly the same. And the test I use for this, basically, and you're just at a, at a high level, this is, you know, not, not getting into like SEO, not research, is if I could take your content and put it on your competitor site and nobody could tell the difference, what have you done? Right. It should be different in perspective. It should be different in the substance of it. You should have a point of view like and particularly this is true for everybody. But for a consultant, you literally live and die by your point of view, by your perspective, by your insight. And so if you are running, a, whether you're a solo consultant, you've got a small firm or a big firm, it needs to sound different. And, and here's kind of what I mean by that. I'm not going to pull this up on the screen right now, but just go take a look for a second and pull up. Mackenzie's site, right? And then go pull up Carney. Put them next to each other. These are two firms that literally started out of the same firm like 100 years ago. And they have very different brands, very different voices, very different areas of expertise. And if you look at them side by side, I think that actually becomes very apparent very quickly. Um, and it maps to what they do inside the company. And that can be done too of any small firm as well, right? Think about a bank, the banks that you use, you put them side by side. It's like, what's the difference between Capital One and Hancock? If you live in Louisiana and you sort of look at that, you, you, there are some differences. I mean, that's the nature of brand, right? So make it to where people, people often come to say, oh, someone's stealing my content. Make your content unstealable. Right. I mean, no one is stealing, you know, Matt Charney's content, for example, because like no one would believe that anyone else wrote it. You agree with them or disagree? Doesn't matter. Same with Tim Sackett. I mean, this is looking in some of my favorite HR examples or Lori Rudiman. Why would you can't steal their content because no one else would say it the way that they say it? That should be your objective for yourself and for the other consultants in your firm. All right. This is where I think we sometimes even as consultants and I consider myself one can get a little like stuck. Right. We're so determined to be professional and to be, you know, this is what serious people sound like. We're talking about serious things. And I love to quote my friend Mike Carden. I've got him here as the founder of Sonar 6. I should update that. He's got a new company called Joyous. But one of the things that always kind of rings in my head is anytime you have the choice between being professional and being memorable, choose memorable. Now, that doesn't mean being rude. It doesn't mean being mean. It doesn't mean doing anything harmful to other people. It doesn't mean trolling people, but it means that it's okay to take that little bit of yourself and bring that out into your messaging. All right, so I keep saying this CVP, right? And content value proposition. And let me tell you what I technically very specifically mean by that. If your business value proposition succinctly captures how your firm's services create value, what I call your what for whom, like when I'm doing this work for clients and I'm doing this messaging work, what do you do and who do you do it for, right? You, and I feel very confident that if you've got a firm that is of any size and stability, you can answer that question. You have to take that same idea and put it all the way over into your content value proposition, what I call it, apply it to the content. So if your content, if your product is all about supply chain consulting for mid-market manufacturers, your content needs to be for, it's about supply chain issues for mid-market manufacturers. And I wish that I could say that like that's like should be an obvious statement, but it often isn't. I will encounter people taking and writing really generic stuff. And then once you've got that bucket, then you need to get really specific. What's your mission, vision, you know, and values? And so how do you then apply that? It's like, are you kind of edgy and innovative? You know, are you reliable, you know, and secure? It's like, so then bring that voice. And when you're done with that, if you can make it match what you did on the business side, like now you've got great content. The other way I like to think about that um, is to think about who is on the other side of it. I think it's the whom for whom that we often really, really forget. And I think this is a great example. You heard me mention Carney earlier, um, and I can tell you, we, they're a client. You know, we absolutely enjoy working with them. This is one of the projects we work on with. It's called Inside the Mind. 
there are a ton of business podcasts. There is literally no shortage of B2B podcasts, and 90% of them are what I call two bros and a microphone. And no offense to the bros out there, and no offense to your, I'm sure, lovely microphones. I've got enough of this in my life. Like, I just don't need it. It all sounds the same to me at this point. Um, so when we set out to do this retail podcast, like Carney has this amazing in-house um, institute for retail research. I mean, the two folks you see up here, Greg and Katie, are the, among the world's experts in retail trends and innovation and new product development. I mean, they're just two of the most interesting people you'll ever meet. If you ever want to just get very self-conscious about your show, your shopping habits, like just go read some of their stuff and you're like, oh yeah, I guess that is, why, why did I buy that? Like, so in thinking about the unique value proposition of Cardi, right? And that they're original and like the way that they think about and people's voices, what does that look like in a podcast? Definitely doesn't look like the two of them just kind of chatting back and forth, right? Instead, we all work together and develop out a concept for essentially a podcast that is more this American life. Like we go out and we interview consumers in the demographics that we're talking about and we draw the insights out of them and then we pull it together, you know, we've got the research and, you know, and Greg and Katie are very lively, engaging hosts. They kind of comment on all the things that come together. But what the result is something that is, I would say, 100% carding. Like, I don't know that any of the other major consulting firms like could have produced this in the same way that they did. It is so thoroughly original to them, which happens to be one of their values. All right. Once you figured out how to be interesting, you know, how to be original in, in this in this situation, you've got your CVP, you know what kind of content you're gonna make and who you're gonna who you're gonna make it for. You have to have a meaningful plan to promote this content. And this is super important because I think this comes up a lot. I find that people will put a lot of love and a lot of work into producing the assets. And then the distribution is an afterthought. And or so that's one thing. And they kind of all scramble. Oh, we'll push it out in an email. We do all these things. That part actually needs to get planned up front. And I know it's not like sexy and popular to say I am a big fan of a waterfall method for doing this. We talk a lot about waterfall and agile. And I know like people want to be agile, like capital A agile. But I think for major initiatives, you know, big pieces of content, things, campaigns you really want to drive progress on. Um, I think that Agile is often not the right fit. I think that it's better if you sit down and you say, look, what's the outcome that I want to achieve at the end of this? What are the assets I'm going to need? I like to see email campaigns buttoned up and ready to go, you know, before a podcast launches. I like to see social campaigns mapped out. Well, how does this look in social? Because I think otherwise, until you really get your groove with it, you know, you can build on it with Agile. But otherwise, I find that it just doesn't happen. So get a real plan. The second thing I want to talk about is paid spend, because I think that there, as much as I wish that having awesome creative was enough to make a content campaign successful, it is not true, right? It's like, I, I, great creative is at the core, right? You need great creative and a great promotion strategy, and that includes real money. And one of the things that it, it still shocks me, like perfectly, you know, big companies with big marketing budgets, and the way they often get distributed in different places and what, you know, where money goes. And it's like, I'm often surprised at the expectations that people place on content. And then they are often set up in a way that actually, frankly, it is designed to fail. And I, I'm a big fan of Chris Walker. If you're not following him on LinkedIn, he's the CEO of Refine Labs. It's a demand gen agency. His content is itself like amazing. He does these really great videos. And I love his philosophy here. You know, we are under such pressure as B2B marketers, whether for consulting firms, you know, in-house, you know, or for in tech firms, that the idea of lead gen, it's like, oh, lead gen, and I'm going to pay money for ads and that better lead to lead gen, or you can't get justification for your budget. That is actually, it seems like a hard, you know, businessy way to think about it. It, it isn't actually how any of this works. Um, it's more like Chris, as Chris says, paid social is guaranteed delivery of your content to the target audience. You're no longer just hoping that it happens, right? It's like, I've got a new podcast, here's a new episode. I know who I, I want people to listen. This is my target reader, my target buyer. I'm going to pay money to put it in front of them because I want them to listen to it. And you, you have to have a good chunk of that budget be going knowing that it's not going to generate leads in the short term. It's just not. What it will do is build demand 
for your services. It will build your brand. It will build trust and it will show up in Lyft. But at least content marketing is a six month plus play. It's not an overnight play. So one of the first things you have to do to be successful here is just get people to understand it's gonna take a bit. All right, content strategy. What do I mean by that? I mean, I, I can use those terms in a couple of different ways. So usually when I say strategy in the course of my work, I'm talking specifically about using content marketing to solve business problems. And business problems to me are things like, no one's ever heard of us, right? So it's brand awareness, it's uh, we need leads. That is a real problem. It's like, I'm not getting qualified leads. We're doing all this stuff. We don't get, how can we get qualified leads? It's uh, our clients keep leaving. We have a retention problem. Sometimes content can help there. Um, hey, we want more referrals. We can do that. Um, employer branding can be a problem like the content helps solve. It's like we aren't getting enough qualified applicants with the right values alignment. OK, well, what are you doing to communicate to the world your values? Right. So we apply content that way. The way I'm going to use content in this particular context is sort of some buckets that we use to categorize content. Um, and the, the first one I want to talk about is thought leadership, which I think is what most people, what comes to mind for most people when they think about content marketing for consultants, because like I said, they, they kind of were the earliest adopters of it. You know, the white paper is fundamentally a consulting outcome you know, outside of academia. I mean, that was the original McKinsey model, right? I mean, people have been writing, people, consultants have been writing white papers for a really long time. So what does thought leadership mean in this context now? You know, thought leadership is, if you're going to do this, you actually have to have some big ideas. And I think that's the part where this gets scary. You know, what does it mean um, to, like, actually drive, like, the conversation in your industry? Like, that is, this is where you put your stake down and you say, you know what, we know more about this than anybody else. So the challenge in this case, though, is to show that you actually have these original ideas. The good news for you is as consultants, you are absolutely brimming with ideas. The consulting firms are, I, I really enjoy this work. It's some of my favorite work to do. It's kind of where we've even shifted our primary focus as a business. There's so many places you can get ideas, right? So your pitches for new business. So uh, David C. Baker, who I follow, he's a consultant for consultants, gets a little meta, but his book, The Business of Expertise is something that I consider that must read material for anybody really for anybody at this point, because I think we're all in the business of expertise, but I think for consultants in particular, I think it's a great, it's a great read. But he talks about how, as when you're pitching, right, if you're a partner in particular, or you're never going to be more on your toes than when you're winning over a client. And you're going to say things that are actually, they seem routine and normal to you, but they are actually deep insights to the client. The, the things that trigger those aha moments. We are terrible at recognizing this in ourselves, right? So have somebody else come along, kind of make notes, you know, if you can record the call when it's virtual, kind of go back and kind of listen to it. But you're going to find that there's, that's when you start to build. And if you're having really meaningful conversations, there's good ideas in there. Your client meetings, like the ongoing ones, you know, you've got these relationships, they're calling you up and they're saying, hey, I got this problem, can I use your help with it? If, if one person calls you to ask for help, odds are 10 people are having that problem. And while you don't want to take, you know, they're paying you for your specific advice to their specific problem, that, and that's what you're selling, you can still take and write a generalized version of that insight. Like, so the third time somebody asks you something, you're like, huh, okay, yeah, I'm going to go write about this, because I can write about it in a generalized way. Which this actually brings me to something I do want to point out. Um, one of the biggest challenges, this, I still run into this, less so than I, than I did 10 years ago, people are afraid of giving away their ideas. This is not something I ever encounter like with the tech firms on the consulting side. They say, oh, well, if I put it all out there like that, they won't have any reason to hire me. I mean, if your advice is that generic, I mean, yeah, you got trouble, right? But the way I think about it is I can give you general advice about what I have learned, noticed, seen. I can share that without us being in an engagement, you know? What you pay for is for me to apply that specific expertise and perspective to your specific problem and to learn those particulars and to care about those particulars. What you're actually paying for is my attention, right? What people really, this is another, people, we, we talk about this, we're paying for people's time. You know, consultants sell their time, you know, billable hours. It's like, 
But in the end, do people really come to you to buy your time or do they buy your attention, buy your expertise and your attention? So you writing a general white paper or a guide or a LinkedIn post or making a quick video about a topic does not put your livelihood in any danger. It just prepares people for the ideas when you really get in there in the specific. That's how you find out if there's alignment at the high level before you jump in into the weeds. Nobody should ever be surprised if they hire you to find out like how, what you think about a certain topic. If that happens, your marketing has absolutely failed as a consultant. All right, the next one I have on here, this one's often one that um, when we come in and we're doing work with people, they're surprised by this and then they're delighted by it once they realize it. When you have seniors talking to juniors, the things that seniors tell juniors, they don't think about it, right? And they're telling them and they're coaching them into the roles. Those are often really, really good sources of ideas for content, um, both for things that are just for the general public, you know, for Legion or whatever, but especially for your employer brand content. There is no reason to keep that. You, right now, if the conversation happens between those two people, the only two people that benefit are those two. If you capture that and make notes and create content around that concept, everybody benefits. Everybody who ever thinks about working for your firm when you're trying to recruit, it, it just, it, you basically you're allowed to scale that intimacy um, and that relationship. And then the last one is SEO. And I think we're gonna talk more about SEO content here in a second, but SEO is also a good source of ideas for content. So one of my favorite hobbies, um, and I'll start off doing a project like for real, right? Just working on some piece of content, like where I'm, oh, I gotta go research this. And then I'll wind up going down the rabbit hole of like, what, what are people searching? Um, if you look at search trends and volume and you start to see what is going up, you know, that's where you could have seen the rise and the great resignation, you know, but even more interestingly, you could have noticed if you were monitoring some of these things, you might have even noticed like, hey, more people are applying for jobs or people are looking for like those things that people search. This is as a direct conduit into people's psyche as we could ever have. So if you use a tool like SEMrush or AREFs, you can actually monitor. This is the listening portion of, of SEO. What are people talking about? Because then you can take that and say, oh, I've got something to say about that topic. All right. And I've got here, this is a picture of my, my youngest child. Um, and I'll tell you all, this photo was taken because we were at Mardi Gras this past year, you know, after a few years of not being able to have that kind of, of celebration. So, you know, she got a little older. We call right now, this is like she's seven. So we say this, oh, she's at her peak Mardi Gras years. Like that age is like super, super fun. Mardi Gras parades are just a thrill. And we had told her going out there that there was going to be, um, that they had live chickens in Cajun Mardi Gras. And she thought we were lying. And to be fair, we often prank her. You know, for example, we were telling her, we were thinking about a trip to New Zealand and we told her that all the Pokemon were upside down. She had to go, now she's found YouTube. And she's found Google and she's like, that's a lie. Like the Pokemon are not upside down in New Zealand. So um, this was the face though, that she made whenever she saw that in fact, there were indeed live chickens on the, the float at the parade. And this is also very similar to the face that um, that I make sometimes in the calls when we're talking about thought leadership, right? Um, there's an interesting thing that happens sometimes where we don't know what we know and we don't value it fully, right? Because uh, David Baker says you can't read your own label, you know, from inside the jar. And so sometimes I will encounter situations where especially younger consultants, um, often uh, people of color often struggle with this too. Women struggle with this. We ask, they, they don't, they have a hard time seeing themselves as thought leaders. And I've had situations where people that I thought of as, and I, and I used to be more judgmental about this. I'm kind of my, because it's fundamentally, it's comes back to imposter syndrome. You know, that term, I have a lot of, feels about that term, you know, and how it puts the responsibility on the person and not the system that made them feel that way. But, you know, I actually, we had, you know, early years, many years ago as an agency, one of our other consultants was on a call and, you know, she was this woman who was very accomplished in her field. And, and she said, okay, well, what do you want to say about this topic? And she was interviewing and she said, well, I, I don't know, like, what would a thought leader say? You know, and so it's easy to have like some frustration and contempt around that. You know, I mean, I certainly remember being like, oh my God, this is going to be a long engagement. But what she really needed was permission to be a thought leader, right? Of course she had great insights. She was a very accomplished, very skilled at her job, but like in her mind, a thought leader was somebody else. And the truth is all the really great people have that are great at this do have some question of that. They're wondering, are, am I actually interesting? This is really a good idea. So 
ask your, when you're asking yourself, what would a thought leader say? The answer is, well, what would you say? You know, what would you say? And Izzy says, man, that's a real chicken. All right. So we talked about where to get ideas. The next thing I want to do is actually give you like a, I got a, this is another really, really good example of, um, of a place that I would sort of a, their CDP is applied very, very well into their content. So Ken and Carta is a consulting firm and they are also a certified B Corp and they're really into sustainability. And what I love about what they have done and they, their really, really excellent marketing team has done here. They took the core part of Ken and Carta around sustainability and they didn't just make a blog, they made a magazine and it's called The Thread. And they talk about all of the things that are important to, you know, the way that they solve problems. You know, they just brought it into this magazine and it's a really, really great example of a great CVP. So highly, highly recommend that y'all go, go check this one out. Beautiful, beautiful brand, good people all around. All right, I talked about SEO. I touched on it in the context of research and inspiration, but I wanna talk about SEO content now because I think poor old SEO content gets deeply misunderstood and we assume that it is inherently boring and repetitive and many people, what they're still thinking of the old keyword stuffing days, it doesn't, actually have to be like that. And in fact, the better, you almost can't. I mean, the new Google updates, you'll see like a lot of kind of SEO people kind of wringing their hands over, there's two types of SEO people right now. Like after, every time Google puts out another update and they're like, oh shit, right? Because they put so much effort into technical SEO and over, oh, we got the keywords and then we did this and we did that and our H2s and our H1s. And then there's the other group that's like, oh yeah. And that's because they put it in all their work into making the content original and differentiated but then also making sure that all the keywords are in there, right? So there's two ways you can go about this. What Google most, and I'm talking, I know there's other search engines, but let's, we're just gonna pretend, they follow the same principles. We're just gonna pretend for about Google for now. What Google values most, like what makes content successful? You need strong expertise, high authority, and trustworthiness. These are the three elements that Google, this is what they use. I mean, all the other details in the algorithm are just, I mean, they are truly that just details. The cool thing if you're a consultant is you should already have these things, right? A good consulting firm has these things in abundance. They, this is an edge you have over your competitors in tech. So own this, okay? Your content is, if you get the good stuff from the inside and get it in the, out, in the outside and publish it, you are, you're gonna have a great shot at winning the SEO game. So what makes great content for SEO? This is a couple of other things that are the, the things that usually kind of surprise people a little bit. So one, it's long form. You got to go long and it feels long. And you're like, oh, my God, who's really going to read this? Actually, people do. Um, and when you give Google highly values, long, comprehensive updates and sort of explainers on topics, they love glossaries. It's a glossaries. You know why? Because people like glossaries. They very much want to read this content. And so we simultaneously tell ourselves this weird story about how nobody wants to read long form content anymore. Very different. What it actually tells us is nobody wants to read content. Don't in there and give you the details. The second piece is you have to update it. And in the world of like MQLs and SQLs, like this seems like, but, but, but somebody, how am I gonna know that they read it? Well, Mendes will tell you if they read it. Terminus will tell you if they read it. Like start get some, HubSpot will tell you if they read it. Like go get yourself some good tracking software and don't depend on people giving you their email to do that. So ungate it, write long. And then the other interesting thing that I think it's like sort of as you start to get that content going, you're not going to be writing new content all the time. I think that's also where people get intimidated by having to write long form. You know, if they're shifting from a model where everybody expected to write, okay, we're going to write a 500 word blog post and we're going to write them every single day. Um, you know, Lee, a former consultant used to be, we used to talk about that, the days of like, man, we posted two times a day. Can you believe we ever wrote two times a day on the blog? But they were super short pieces. Now, if you're posting, you know, if you're a small firm once a month and it's deep and meaningful, I'd rather see 3,500 words once a month than 500 words twice a day. Like, just don't even do it. Don't even do it. 
Um, the second piece of this too is the regular updating. So once you've written it once, when you come back and write about another topic, like write about the topic again, don't write another blog post. Remember, your goal is to have a single comprehensive answer to that question. That is what Google will reward. So stick with it. When you need to say something new, go back to the old URL. Do not abandon that URL. Like a take you probably means if you need a good content audit, you should jump in there, see everything you ever said about a topic, pull it together, redirect it, you know, find the best URL and push them all there. Um, but don't keep publishing new things and don't reward that. Like don't expect that, don't encourage it. It's better to be meaningful and regular and just go back and update stuff. Upd updates are quick, they're way less painful. All right, this is, um, I'm gonna kind of quote here, my, my friend Viola, Eva, is, as I say, my beloved Flow SEO. This is a B2B SEO agency that we frequently collaborate with. And she has a couple of wonderful, wonderful ways that she explains this because people often think of SEO content as super generic. Again, it's the keywords and you know, you're just pushing out this content. But truthfully, like that, you don't, you're not really as constrained by that as you think you are. Like SEO tells you what to talk about right and what sort of phrasing to start with your thought leadership tells you how to talk about it right it's, it's your perspective ought to answer that question and she uses um a couple of great examples one of them here is cinderella you know that like you can have the same bones on the piece right it's the same core topic you might even have the same headers you know h1s h2s but if you are truly creating differentiated content your responses the stuff in there is going to be different right it's going to be as different as this cartoon Cinderella, you know, from 60, 70 years ago and a live action Cinderella. It's going to be as different, you know, as whenever, I guess, Ryan Adams covered Taylor Swift, like co cover songs are really, think of it as a cover song in some ways, like she's got a great model for that, but we frequently work on projects together and this is how we work. She brings me, I give her my messaging, she comes in with the research, she gives me briefs, we come back with like point of view. And in the end we have SEO, content like great seo content that absolutely wins and ranks that also delivers the company's perspective you can do this all right the next thing i kind of always put this in a bucket even though it overlaps with those other things um, is abm and demand gen content so this in addition to having you know every every good content marketer should have a an seo you know bff i've also got my demand gen bffs um so the, the ADM and demand gen as strategies for marketing require a ton of content to be effective, right? So we need each other. That's the way we always talk about this. It's like, okay, if I'm going to do this, step one of demand gen is to be interesting. You can't create demand if you're not interesting. So what do these two things mean in the context of consultants? Um, they're, first of all, I want to clarify, they're actually like demand gen and ABM are different things. Account-based marketing refers specifically to a strategy in which you focus on a hand, like sort of a limited number of key accounts. And your goal is to get in there, get a foothold, and then expand and deepen the relationship, upsell, cross sell. Like you are, instead of like kind of going out there and trying to get a bunch of leads and then filtering through all the mess and seeing who's qualified and then getting, it, it kind of turns it on its head. It says, it is, it's particularly good for a B2B and for enterprise. It's good for consultants. If you know who you want to work with, which your universe is probably not that big of like who is a who is your right fit client you know you then you just put all of your marketing efforts on getting those people and making content that appeals to those groups so the second piece of that you know we, that's abm demand gen is a model where instead of focusing on lead gen you know this kind of idea that marketing's job is to generate leads for sales to pick up and close this throws that away um, and replaces it instead with a model that, you know, marketing's job is to contribute to revenue at every stage of the cycle, right? Our job is to drive revenue, not just hand over MQLs of whatever an MQL is, right? Like, I don't even know anymore. So I can tell you one thing, someone who downloads a white paper is not an MQL, like not by, I just don't, just don't, they don't count. In the world of demand gen, the only lead that counts is when somebody literally explicitly raises their hand and says, I would like to talk to sales. So it, you can imagine like content starts to play a different sort of role when you flip to that model. Instead of saying, I've got to go produce content to get these leads, these downloads, and my work here is done, you've now got a more, both of these, both ABM and demand gen require a much tighter relationship between the two. 
all right people because again lead gen still comes up like i you know lead gen is part of demand gen right so you don't necessarily and first of all i also you know realistically people think that leads are like the most important thing you know I, I, to the point where i have people call me and say well we just don't get enough leads and i was like okay well, why don't you get enough leads i was like well the problem is we get the meetings and they're really good but nobody's ever heard of us and it's like okay so you don't have a legion problem you have a brand awareness problem no but we need leads Right, but there's no lead gen problem that doesn't actually start, you know, six months back with a demand gen, like in brand awareness fail. So do both, you get to do both. And I also, I love this picture because this is what um, this, this girl actually, she's an adult now and this is what she looks like and she's still super cute. All right, I've got examples. Here's a good example of this for you of demand gen content and it might not look like what you think. Um, these are our pals over at Lead Gen who are absolutely thought leaders in HR tech. They, this is a consulting firm. Um, you know, they they actually, so because also the other thing I think demand gen content, you think content means I put out a white paper, I put it a guide, it's planning gate. Absolutely not. This is a weekly meetup. This is a leak, you, know, you can use LinkedIn Live, you can use webinars, like anything that you're doing to be interesting, to get in front of your target audience, to build that relationship, to build that rapport. And guess what? Jason and Jess are interesting. And this is a way for them to be interesting and be accessible at scale. They certainly couldn't have this many meetings with clients that day, but it's like you can access their thinking in this way. And, and it's just, anybody can just pop on and listen. It doesn't, there's no work, there's no friction, which is one of the other principles of demand gen is there's no friction. Like you wanna reduce the friction in the sales process every step of the way. But, Love, this is a great, if you're trying to figure out what your virtual event, you know, as we go in hybrid, like what conversations look like and how to show up, this is a great model if you want to go check them out, regardless of whether you're an HR tech or not. If you're an HR tech, I'm sorry, you'll have to beat this, but if you're not, then you can copy it. <laughs> All right, so to gate or not to gate, which I was just touching on a little bit with the friction question, um, honestly, the answer, my, and this is where, again, my demand gen friends, my SEO friends, that's why we get along so well, I rarely want to gate. I do not consider the success of my work to be like X number of downloads of a white paper, like because somebody coughed up their emails. Like we're giving fake emails now. Like just because somebody wants to read a white paper does not mean they want to talk to sales. Like we are making, we are annoying people and creating barriers for people to connect with our content. Like that's insane. My least favorite is whenever people are pay, actually paying money for that. You're buying an ad and you're sending to a landing page and then you're asking them for a bunch of information in a form and there they went, right? It's like you just paid, like, you just paid for them to like come over and then you, I don't know, it's so weird. It's like, what? don't do this to people. Why would you treat your buyers this way? All right, so what do I mean? Like when, when do we gate, right? And how do we decide to what gate? And before I talk about that, I wanna talk about uh, one of my favorite books that I just recently read called Measure What Matters. It's by John Doerr. And I think we get really into marketing. I mean, in general, in business, there's this push toward like, it's the measure. People see the measure part. They're like, yeah, we got to measure more stuff. And I think that they forget that the second half of this is what matters. And the danger with content marketing and ABM and like all of these cycles is that we are measuring shit that does not matter, right? So that we can report it to someone to feel like, look, our work is measurable and reportable and it is right it actually is measurable but it should be measured by revenue like pipeline contribution not by th things like downloads and site views and traffic i mean those are all what i would they're all leading indicators they're good things you want to see those things happen but i would just say as you work on you know if you want to get control of what abm looks like and what content looks like inside your organization get a hold of the what matters part when it comes to this this model um, I could sort of an example of this actually. This, this drives me absolutely bonkers, I will tell you. Um, one of the most important pieces of content that we can put out as consultants are our case studies. That is the narrative of the impact of our work. Like, what did we do for whom? But now I've got a specific example. It builds trust, it builds authority, it gets people thinking tactically and concretely about how you could solve their problem. And then we make case studies. And then we gate them. Please don't gate case studies. Like that of all the things that is such a bottom of the funnel, like content piece, like people read case studies and then they go to the sales call. Like, you want them to read that. So please do not put any friction behind that. And I think if you're looking for a good example of how to use case studies to tell narrative for a consulting firm, check out Eagle Hill. 
they've got their living labs model. They've got this beautiful, beautiful site where it's like they actually have, it's, it's all about the case studies. Case studies are their primary form of content. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. And make your case studies and let people see them. Let your case studies go free. Um, when can you gate? There is my limited exception to this. You can gate it if what you've got is so good and so specific and so unique that somebody is going to be like, yep, I'm going to give my email up for that and I'm good with it because I also know that what's going to come after this is going to have a lot of value. And one of my favorite examples of this is what Gallup does, you know, around employee engagement. I mean, they kind of, they, the, the data they have is is bar none, you know? I mean, they've done for employee engagement data what ADP did for payroll data. Like I always tell people back when I was doing a good example of thought leadership, back when I was a reporter, I didn't wait for BLS numbers to know how pay, you know, how pay was going. I, I looked at ADP because they had the real numbers. And I would say in the case of Gallup, I, I, I get it. I'm, I mean, I'm happy to give, they can have my email address. And then when the things they send me in follow up, there are more elaboration and content on the, you know, the stuff that was in the report. You know what they've never done? They've never called me to try to sell me anything, which is good because I'm not their ICP, but I do share their content, um, which is, you know, that's a benefit to them, right? Yeah, don't, don't make people, that, that, people will put up an email for that. That's okay. All right, so that brings me to the end of the formal part of this presentation. Do y'all have questions for me? Let's see, I'm gonna go back in here and take a look at where folks have dropped in notes. Um, I did see one, hang on. Uh, so Will said, I think that content marketing is a multi-year commitment and it's also not a start stop thing. If you stop for six months, you won't pick up where you left off. You absolutely will not. I find that this is actually one of the most common mistakes that I see people make in general with this, it, and this isn't just to consultants, it is a certain amount of patience um, that you need to have around, you're selling an idea, right? So as a consultant and as a content marketer, your job is to sell ideas. It's not necessarily to sell a product in that exact moment. You know, before you can sell the services, before you can sell the product, you've got to sell the idea ahead of it. And your job in closing the deal, and even once you're in it, like getting the decisions made that move people toward where they need to go to solve their problem, it's a lot easier if they've already bought in to the idea on some level, hopefully to a, a large level. So this is an investment in your future efficiency is another way to think about it. Um, so I would, you know, just thinking about the patience, it's absolutely, it shouldn't even be a six month thing. I mean, you're, if you're trying to really change the world, if you're really trying to change people's minds about things, give yourself 18 months. You know, I, I see people giving up on campaigns like way too fast. Like we as marketers and the business people, they get tired of reading it before it even has a chance to, to actually catch on with our buyer. They need those 10 touches, right? To feel, to really connect with an idea. And we're going, yeah, well, there was your one. And well, let's go make something else. Um, in almost all ca most cases, people could be making less content and putting more into the derivative part of that, like the social content. They could be putting more into the promotion and the distribution. So uh, there's another quick question here. How much time should you spend per week creating content? Um, that I'm not sure how well I could answer that. If, like, if it's a solo consultant, if it's just you, you know, in the business, I mean, it's probably going to be, I'd say, a fifth of your time. Um, I think that's an important part of like your business development and like creating content, sharing content is going to be your primary marketing driver to get new business. So it's a fifth of your time. If I'm looking at it, when I start to scale that out into mid market and enterprise or really honestly, even back in boutique firms, it's like, you know, then I'm asking a bigger question around well, what's the total marketing strategy? What's the marketing budget? It's not any particular person's time. It's, it's about budget and resources. Okay. Sorry, I forgot questions. Here we go. Um, the title of my business of expertise, that is the business of expertise by David C. Baker. Um, and then I was going to, if you make a video as well as a written version of the content, should you post them together in the same location or separately? I'm going to pull that girl back up with a why not both, right? Um, video, the really fun thing is like if you have a video version, you can embed it. Like so um, this is actually beneficial to your SEO, right? So if you have a long form piece of content, that's text and then you put in the embed the video, that's actually a benefit to you. So please just go ahead and do that. 
Um, all videos should also have captions, you know, and even transcripts are even better. I hate videos. I'm serious. Like, I don't watch them. If you gave it, all I'm going to watch a video is if I have no choice whatsoever to get the information I want. So I do very much appreciate it if people do things that are in video, that if they also attach a transcript that I can scan and read. So use both in as many places as you like. Um, I've got a question. There's a boutique consulting firm in a specific market. Any advice in terms of frequency that will help reinforce our brand? You know, it's in some ways it's less about frequency. I would say think about channels. Um, I'm gonna assume boutique means you've got 25 employees or less, right? 25 you know, consultants or less. You're going to want some sort of like, I think you want one big piece, like sort of, I'll call it like a big piece a year. You're gonna really only have it that size, one big report in a, in your year, in your year. You're probably gonna have then one a quarter for sort of some mini kind of campaigns underneath it, right? That's a guide, like that's some sort of piece that kind of builds on the big idea, but kind of backs it up a little. And then you can publish, if you only publish long form blog post type content, like once a month or every other week, I mean, that's fine. Um, you might also hop on and do things on LinkedIn. If, if you're comfortable there and you're productive, like I would tell you to go as you know, weekly if you can handle it, every few weeks if you can handle it, you know, just making sure that you're showing up. The one thing I would tell you to absolutely put on a schedule is your email newsletter. Email newsletters is, email is the most, that is the low hanging fruit, you know, to use that, that metaphor. Um, it is the way, is the easiest touch you'll ever have to keep that. It's just such an easy nurture. It'll also just force you. It's like, look, we publish the newsletter and we publish it once a month. So if you don't have a newsletter right now, publish it once a month. That's going to then force you to say, well, what are we saying in the newsletter, which is going to make you back up and say, well, I guess we should, what are we going to say, right? And so then you're going to make this other stuff. So even if you don't waterfall it out, like I described earlier, having that newsletter on the calendar is going to nudge you into having stuff to say in the other pieces. Um, I can also tell you that frequently the things I put on social, like LinkedIn is my preferred, like off, I don't write blog posts, I write LinkedIn posts. And oftentimes what I say in LinkedIn, I then take and adapt and use in our newsletter. But get that newsletter scheduled. I want a monthly newsletter if you don't have one. And if you have a monthly one, I want a weekly one. So um, next, content marketing. Is that an essential part of PR strategy? Well, I certainly like to think so. Um, in part because I think that PR, as we once understood it, especially for B2B and for consulting, is, is irreparably changed. I mean, it's mostly about thought leadership and putting yourself out there as an expert in a field so that when reporters are writing stories, they do call you, you know, that you get opportunities for placed articles in your trade media if you want speaking gigs. So as as one of the people, so I've had, I've had kind of two interesting roles here, right? So I used to be a reporter and I was bombarded by this stuff all day long. And I still am as a publisher of a magazine. We've got managing editor magazine. Um, and I get bombarded by this stuff all the time. The ones that catch my eye, are the ones that come from people that are like, oh, this person is an expert in this. I have to associate you with something. Just saying, I'll, you can interview me anytime about anything is not a useful statement. If you're like, hey, if you ever have a question about supply chain, sustainable supply chain, then I know exactly who to call with those questions, right? Um, you know, for product innovation, you know, or knowledge management, it's like you start to like, you, you associate brands you know, with ideas, and that's how you start to know who to call. The second piece of this, um, because again, this landscape has changed, we have so few reporters now, many of your best media opportunities are actually going to be organized by other vendors, like by other service providers, with brand newsrooms and sort of brand content arms. When I'm looking for speakers, because I do this work now, when I'm mapping out who's gonna speak at an event and I'm reaching out and saying, hey, would you like to come speak? Or, hey, would you, can we interview you for the post? I am looking for things that you've already written. I'm out there, if you haven't been publishing, I'm not calling you, right? I'm not gonna find you. So I would say, yes, content is absolutely an essential part of PR because otherwise the reporters and the people who make those decisions, they aren't gonna find you. Um, so let's see, Basker said, we talk about long form, blog posts, content model, what's the ideal word limit, a thousand words, 1500 words. So there is going to vary, you know, if you're using a tool like SEMrush, it's going to tell you exactly kind of give you, it's going to give you a recommendation of a range of how long you need to be to get to win this term. Um, 1500 words though is pretty much your floor. Like I think at any meaningful keyword in 2022, like you are going to have a hard time. 
So we talk about sometimes about um, the idea of 10x content, right? The idea is to go and see whatever term you want to rank for. So let's say Baskerin, I know that you do HR tech consulting. Okay. I am not ranking on this. I've got my blog. I want, I want to be the first thing you find. You go and you see who's currently ranking, and you read all the things that they've written. Now, your next move is not to copy what they did. Your next move is to take what they did and make it 10 times better. And 10 times better is probably going to mean significantly longer. It's going to mean richer content. Give me examples, like get deep. I mean, basically, you know, look at what they've done and kind of see where the opportunity is and like then outdo them. That's your goal. That's how you win that spot. And um, it's probably going to involve if the current ranking, if the top 10 ranking or top three ranking posts are 1,500 words, I need you to write 2,500. If they're 25, well, I need to see your 3,500 words. Like <laughs> if they're at five, well, you're going to have to write a book. <laughs> so not every keyword is like that, though. A lot of you can get them from a little less investment than that. All right. I think that that brings us to the end of the questions that I saw in the Q&A. Um, and then everybody here is like, let's look at the chat. They're in a couple of different places. Um, all right, cool. It looks like that brings us to the end and we're almost right on time. Well, thank you all so much. I hope everybody has a great rest of your day.